This video is brought to you by War Thunder. What's up Wisecrack, Jared here. I'm not sure if you've noticed a trend lately, but a lot of very smart people are acting incredibly dumb. Elon Musk made some very bold and very wrong statements about coronavirus, musical genius Kanye West has announced a run for president without even filing the right paperwork, and I can't seem to go a day without finding out some award-winning scientist hawking weird pseudoscience. Professor Montagnier is first of all a medical doctor, a pragmatist. He's convinced that water memory opens a new area of research for medicine. This is not the hate on Musk or Kanye. One is, in my humble opinion, a musical genius, and the other changed the landscape of cars with Tesla. But what if some of the weirder antics of people like Musk aren't just regular human error, but speak to a bigger problem about how we understand intelligence? In other words, why do geniuses act so dumb? Welcome to this Wisecrack edition on the myth of genius, and no spoilers ahead. But before we continue, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, War Thunder. From the makers of Cross Out and Star Conflict comes War Thunder, a free large scale combat MMO that's available on PC, PS4, and Xbox One. In the game, you can fight in history's most iconic battles by air, land, or sea. Take your T-80 on a world tour and shoot down some helicopters, or send a massive cruiser to the bottom of the sea. With War Thunder's high-end graphics, it's like being in the middle of history. There are more than 1,500 combat vehicles and over 350 unique airplanes to choose from. The flight sim is one of my favorite parts, since they spare no detail in what it's like to fly a plane. You can customize your vehicles with upgrades, mods, and even custom skins. Then once you're ready, you can choose a battle from World War II, the Cold War, or a modern conflict anywhere on the globe. War Thunder is always updating the game, so there's always something new to explore. You can download the game today for free by using the link in the description. When you download the game using our link, you'll get some awesome bonuses that guarantee some wins at the get-go. So download the game today, and now back to the show. To really understand the strange paradox of genius, I want to tell you the story of Linus Pauling. Born at the beginning of the 20th century, Linus Pauling was a titan of science. In his 30s, he proposed a third way atoms could bind together called orbital hybridization. He then went on to identify several key features of DNA structure, created a formula to measure electronegativity, and discovered the underlying mechanism behind sickle cell anemia. For all his work, Pauling has the distinction of being only one of four people in history to win two Nobel Prizes, though one was a Peace Prize. So if anyone gets the genius title, it's Pauling, right? Well, maybe not. Pauling made another contribution to science, orthomolecular medicine. Coined by Pauling in the late 60s, the term refers to the practice of treating everything from the common cold, to psychosis, to cancer, to even AIDS, with vitamins, taken at extremely high megadoses. Now, I don't think it takes a genius to know that vitamins won't cure cancer, but at the time, this idea gained some major traction. After all, one of the smartest scientists alive was not only advocating for it, but even publishing multiple books about it. But the wider scientific and medical community wasn't buying it. The American Psychiatric Association, for example, wrote a blistering report in 1973 questioning why Pauling's vitamin of choice, niacin, seemed to never provide the results he claimed when experiments were performed by independent investigators. The APA's major concern was that his claims were at best unprovable and at worst dangerous. Despite them calling the practice and its claims deplorable and the American Academy of Pediatrics calling it a cult, Linus Pauling only doubled down until he died in 1994. After his death, a 1996 study on the effects of vitamin A and beta carotene on heavy smokers had to be cut short after lung cancer rates soared 28% and the mortality rate rose a horrifying 17% among the participants. All of which raises the very simple question, how did one of the world's smartest men end up being so dumb? And why do we continue to worship him in spite of this, even catapulting his pseudoscience to the New York Times bestseller list? As it turns out, the idea of genius is a relatively modern concept. The Latin word genius originally referred to an individual spirit that inhabits and protects a person from their birth, thereby determining their character. Which isn't that surprising when you consider the Latin root of genius is gignere, or to birth or beget. So when you grew up to be a tough-as-nails general or a talented bard, ancient Romans would chalk up your talents to your individual 
individual genius, and there's a certain appeal to this. This Roman sense of the word can explain why someone excels in a certain area without committing us to believe they're great at everything. Using this sense of the word, we can immediately see the problem with Linus Pauling. The guy was a brilliant chemist and a biologist looking at the proteins of misshapen blood cells, but not exactly a shoe in for Cancer Doctor of the Year. It wasn't until the 1600s that our modern notion of genius started to emerge. The word began to refer to a specific individual with a natural intelligence or talent and exalted natural mental ability. And this is where the problem starts, where genius begins to gain the revered catch-all status it has today. The word's evolving definition corresponds with the larger cultural shift of the European Enlightenment. This was a time of unparalleled intellectual growth in Western Europe, manifesting everything from the birth of modern science to the creation of calculus, astronomy, and economics. Central to all this intellectual progress, though, was the idea that man could, through his intellect, unlock the keys to the universe and change our world for the better. This is around when we start to see glimmers of our modern-day genius worship. 18th century French philosopher Anne Robert Jacques Turgot, for example, asserted that progress only occurs when an individual genius makes advances in their field. According to Turgot, states have the responsibility to foster these geniuses and allow them to flourish. In his eyes, there probably wouldn't be anything wrong with government subsidizing Tesla or Solar City through lucrative tax credits or giving Kanye's fashion brand Yeezy a small business loan in the wake of COVID-19. It's all in the service of further developing their genius. 19th century Scottish philosopher and mathematician Thomas Carlyle takes this idea of worshipping geniuses one step further. In his book On Heroes, Hero Worship, and the Heroic in History, Carlyle famously stated that the history of the world is but the biography of great men. In Carlyle's view, a select few geniuses were responsible for all the major developments throughout history, while us lay people were just along for the ride. After all, history won't remember the original founders of Tesla, engineers Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpening, much less credit the countless other designers or technicians who have worked towards the company's success. But we won't forget Elon Musk. American philosopher Sidney Hook perhaps best encapsulates this perspective, arguing that genius is not the result of compounding talent. How many battalions are the equivalent of a Napoleon? How many minor poets will give us a Shakespeare? How many run-of-the-mill scientists will do the work of an Einstein? But even though they lauded geniuses, they still distinguish between different kinds of geniuses. Thomas Carlyle, for example, divided his great men into six categories. He wouldn't, for example, compare the genius of a priest like Martin Luther to that of a poet like John Milton. Similarly, Francis Galton, the father of the since extremely debunked theory of eugenics, broke down the star-studded world of geniuses into categories ranging from judges and statesmen to scientists, painters, poets, and even oarsmen. Now, Galton and Carlyle aren't exactly the standard for today's scientific exploration of genius, but if you want to look at the world of smart people saying dumb things, a pretty good red flag is people venturing outside of their speciality. That isn't to say that multi-platinum artist Kanye West isn't allowed to have political opinions, or that scientists haven't excelled in multiple fields. But in today's world of hyper-specialized knowledge, nothing about understanding how jet propulsion works makes one an expert on epidemiology. Nowhere is this more apparent than when you venture into the world of pseudoscience. There you'll see a crop of PhDs and MDs venturing outside of their speciality, claiming to be some revolutionary thinker despite their lack of training or peer-reviewed publications on the topic. Take for example someone like Ivar Yever, who despite being awarded a Nobel Prize for proving electron tunneling occurs in superconductors, also happens to be among the biggest climate change deniers in the scientific community. On the one hand, a genius. On the other, a dum-dum. There's also just people who go off the rails. Take Luc Montier, who proved that a retrovirus causes AIDS, only to turn around and publish two papers claiming that DNA can produce electromagnetic signals when diluted, aka basically homeopathy. Montier's claims were met with scorn from the scientific community. But this is only half the story. There's another reason modern society valorizes geniuses like Albert Einstein or Elon Musk, presuming them to somehow have special brains capable of tackling any problem regardless of the topic. Which brings us to IQ. Cast your mind back to the French countryside in the early 20th century. Universal education has just become a thing, and as your classroom is flooded with children from all sorts of backgrounds, you need to identify which ones have special education needs so they can get extra attention. How do you do this? Well, if you're psychologist Alfred Binet and his assistant Theodore Simon, you decide to test each child to determine what their mental age is. 
A child who could answer all the questions expected of a typical eight-year-old would be said to have the mental age of eight. But if the next eight-year-old could answer the questions for a typical nine-year-old, they'd have a mental age of nine. Now, it's important to note that Binet didn't think this number could fully quantify a child's intellectual capacity or potential, merely that it could predict how a child would perform in school at that point in time. Just because a young Linus Pauling built a chemistry lab from scratch and likely had a higher mental age than his peers wouldn't, in Binet's mind, mean that the other kids couldn't catch up. Even though Binet wasn't trying to quantify genius, two psychologists independently took Binet's model and tried to do just that. The first was Lewis Terman. If Binet was against the idea of ranking people by intelligence, Terman was all for it. Inspired by Galton's theory of hereditary genius and Binet's mental ages, Terman decided he was going to scientifically quantify intelligence. To do so, he applied a simple formula. Mental age divided by physical age times 100 equals intelligence quotient, or IQ. So if you can answer a question that a 10-year-old can and you're only 5, 10 divided by 5 is 2 times 100 is 200. You're a genius. With this simple calculus, Terman instituted the modern regime of IQ testing as we know it today, ranking and sorting everyone from school students to army recruits. But this massive wave of testing brought to light an interesting fact. As English psychologist Charles Spearman first noted, scores across different portions of different IQ tests were positively correlated. In other words, kids who were good at pattern recognition, for example, were also good at vocabulary and memorization. Intelligence, it would seem, wasn't tied to specific subjects or areas. Instead, this statistical correlation implied what Spearman called a general intelligence, better known as G. We now had a modern conception of genius. A genius was someone with a high IQ, which made you smart about almost everything. In committing to this view, we as a society had completed a U-turn on our pre-enlightenment views. Genius was no longer something that everyone possessed, a characteristic or quirk to explain their personality. Instead, it's the domain of the hyper-intelligent, and we should revere them for it. So don't criticize Elon Musk for dipping his toes into predictive modeling in COVID-19, even if he's catastrophically wrong, and don't you dare think that hawking vitamins as a cure for cancer is essentially a multi-level marketing scheme with less steps. We often give these people the benefit of the doubt just because they're seemingly much smarter than us, or at least that's what the cultural narrative wants us to do. It's the reason why Albert Einstein, with zero political experience, was offered the presidency of Israel in 1952 because he's just so smart. But Einstein, understanding that his genius was not universal, declined it, citing his complete and utter lack of experience in the matter. And here's where we can understand how Terman and Spearman got a lot about intelligence wrong. Despite its prominence in popular culture, the IQ test and the concept of monolithic G has been under sustained attack from psychologists for decades. The problem is that intelligence tests, whether they're dealing with logical or spatial reasoning, are only measuring intelligence in a certain sense. It's hard to see how an IQ test will spot the person who's going to make the next big contribution to music, or how a kid with impeccable spatial reasoning will do in the floor is lava. According to psychologist Robert Sternberg, this is where most intelligence tests Tests fail. They refuse to look into the context of what they measure. In Sternberg's view, we're suffering from predictor criterion confusion. That's a fancy way of saying we're using IQ tests to reflect intelligence more than real-world problem solving. To Sternberg, intelligence has to take into account the purposive adaptation to, shaping of, and selection of real-world environments relevant to one's life. In other words, intelligence doesn't occur in a vacuum. Instead, what's considered intelligence changes drastically between cultures, environments, and situations. While being able to spend hundreds of hours studying for the SAT might make you smart by a college's standard, for a hunter-gatherer, intelligence might be linked to the ability to orient yourself in your surroundings while tracking prey. In both cases, our intelligent human is adapting to real-life scenarios to get what they want, even if these forms of intelligence are very different. Going back to Kanye, the only way to measure his specific brilliance is to hear his music. So here's the big question, Wisecrack. If our modern conception of genius rests on IQ tests that are kind of bunk, and a concept of G that might not really mean anything in a broader sense of intelligence, is there really even such a thing as a genius at all? Sure, Elon Musk has had moments of genius, as did Linus Pauling before him, but what if they're actually just smart people who happen to stumble upon some breakthrough ideas? As it turns out, there's some evidence this might be the case. Terman, in his quest for studying geniuses, actually embarked on one of the longest-running longitudinal studies in history. Partnering with the California public school system, he used IQ tests to identify the most gifted children and then followed up with them for the next 35 years. While Terman hoped to find the great men that Carlyle theorized moved history, instead, most of his approximately 1,500 geniuses went on to live normal lives. 
In a devastating analysis, sociologist Peter M. Sorokin demonstrated that Terman's geniuses did just as well in life as a random sampling of kids from a similar socioeconomic status. In other words, genius level IQ didn't produce any Linus Paulings or Elon Musks. In fact, as journalist Malcolm Gladwell points out, Terman actually tested and ultimately rejected two individuals who went on to win Nobel Prizes. Maybe genius isn't a number then, but rather the happy accident of a hardworking, lucky, and ultimately normal person and maybe they get a boost from specific kinds of reasoning skills. Terence Tao, the winner of the Fields Medal in 2006, kind of like the Nobel Prize for math except much more exclusive, takes just this view. He argues the popular image of the lone and possibly slightly mad genius who ignores the literature and other conventional wisdom and manages by some inexplicable inspiration to come up with a breathtakingly original solution to a problem that confounded all of the experts is a charming and romantic image, but also a wildly inaccurate one. To Tao, genius isn't the result of the great men that Carlyle proposed. Instead, the genius stands atop the shoulders of those that came before, whose small incremental advances led to the genius's breakthrough. It's not brilliance, it's simply progress obtained naturally and cumulatively as a consequence of hard work, directed by intuition, literature, and a bit of luck. But what do you think, Wisecrack? Did the simulation just short us the intelligence needed to fully appreciate the legend that is Elon Musk? Let us know in the comments how smart or dumb you think we are for writing this. Thanks to all our awesome patrons for supporting the channel and our podcast. Slam that subscribe button to prove how smart you are or don't. And as always, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.